the way you train is the way you're going to fight in the real world. So you, I mean, obviously we're not going to kill each other on this turf field, but you have to be able to go at it at a good pace. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 153, and thanks for hanging out. On today's episode, we hear from a young woman with two black belts in two very different martial arts styles, Miss Elise Lanahan. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts two times a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host for the show, as well as the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time here. When we developed our line of sparring gear, we took a hard look at why every other brand's gloves seemed to fail so quickly. Through our better materials, smarter design, and extra reinforcement, we've created gloves that simply don't fail. My personal pair is now four years old. I may not spar as much as some of you out there, but these have had a lot of use, and they're just starting to show their very first rip. It's kind of sad, but also a little fun. Got to see how far we could push them, right? You can learn more about our gloves, maybe get yourself a pair at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's also the easiest place to sign up for our great newsletter. In each issue, we send out some special content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Today's guest is someone I've known for years, but that's not why I asked her to come on the show. Miss Elise Lenahan is the only person I know personally to have earned a black belt in a traditional martial art, in this case Taekwondo, and a black belt in the Marine Corps martial arts program. On this episode, we discuss what the process of training in each style was like for her, the difference between the two, and what she's taken from her varied experience as a martial artist. So listen up. Miss Lenahan, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be on the show. Definitely honored to be on it. And so listeners are going to hear the audio difference that, you know, we are face to face, which is always fun. It gives me a little bit, I think, better feel for how things are going. And we're, we're at your parents' house and we're going to talk about, you know, how I know you and why this has all happened, I'm sure, as, as we get through. Uh, and, and part of the reason I wanted you on the show, but let's let all that kind of come through the questions instead of running through a bunch of facts, because that's kind of boring and not really the way that I run stuff. How'd you get started in the martial arts? That's how we get started. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my dad, um, Joe Lenahan, who was on your show actually, uh, God, a while ago now. Um, he was, my, well, my sword was my first Taekwondo instructor. Uh, probably when I was like six or seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used to go to my dad's class, mm-hmm. Randolph, and I just got in it. And I started... I got a uniform and started testing with Master Oda, uh, and then eventually moved to my dad's class mm-hmm. and with Taekwondo. Um, and ever since, I've been, I was pretty regular for most of grade school, high school, and then uh, I went to college and um, not so regular. We had a martial arts club on campus, which I yeah. did, so we learned different styles. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, last year, deployed and uh, def- did uh, some martial arts with the Marines, and that was a lot of fun. Okay. So let's roll back, because there was, there was a lot there. You just gave us, you know, 15 years in a, about 60 seconds. So let's unpack that a little bit. So, you know, you, like a lot of people, started martial arts because of you know, parental influence, you know, you started going with them, but at some point it became your decision to keep training. Yeah. You know, somewhere along the line, I'm not going to pin you down as to when that was, but I will pin you down to why, you know, what was it about Taekwondo that you wanted to keep training? Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, just I'd go in, um, I'd actually work with the adults class probably more than the kids' class at that age, just because my dad was in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found that I was actually pretty good at it. Um, being, you know, so young, mm-hmm. uh, you're like, oh, I'm good at this. I might as well just keep going with it. And Master Order was awesome. 
And uh, I really liked working towards something. And it was something other than school Mm -hmm. (laughs) or homework or just something fun to do. And, um, I mean, yeah, there's just fun. I think that's the reason why most of us started, at least at that age. I think so. I think you're right. Were you playing other sports or had Mar- um, Taekwondo become your extracurricular? Uh, no, I was, uh, I did soccer, mm-hmm. the typical soccer, <laughs> um, skating. I was a figure skater for quite a while. Okay. Uh, I probably started dance shortly after too. Those are my main, um, ones. Okay. But actually skating and dance probably helped the most just because it added a lot of flexibility. Yeah. There's certainly a, a lot of connection there. We've, we, I think we've had some people on the show who have done dance and we've talked about the relationship there, you know, the body control and body awareness and, and, um, the ability to, I I think personally build strength in those smaller controlling muscles, you know, it's something that I think that, that martial arts does more so than I think a lot of other sports, but we haven't had anybody on the show that's talked about figure skating as it might relate to martial arts. So like, when did you start figure skating? Oh, geez. I started figure skating when I was five, maybe. Okay. Five or six. So even before Taekwondo. Yeah. um, Even just like beginner lessons, just learning how to skate, learning how to... Sorry, just keep going. uh, Learning how to uh, just get the basic foot movement down, not fall on my side. Like, you know, uh, like an idiot all the time. (laughs) And um, so... Then I, uh, you know, I got into it more, started liking it, and I started getting into lessons, like group lessons, and we learned, uh, you know, spins and little jumps and just the really basic. Uh, but one of the things that was, you had to have was kind of some kind of flexibility mm-hmm. and also balance because you do a lot of one-footed movement. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably how it helps with Taekwondo is cause you build a lot of leg muscle yeah. and it helps a lot with, uh, kicks especially and just balance in that, uh, respect because when you're on the ice, you have one blade that holds you up right. and you're like, uh, well, if I fall, this is going to suck a lot. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, especially like the toe pick, you got to watch your foot movement. You have to watch. Um, where your legs are, where your feet are, even where your arms are. Um, and then when you get up in the higher ranks of figure skating, uh, you have to you do routines like mm-hmm. you see on TV. And that is a whole beast in itself because not only are you worrying about foot movement, going with the music, but you're also worrying about where your arms are. Mm-hmm. Do I look pretty? Right. <laughs> so... It's like doing forms. Yeah, it really is. So. But with music. Yes. And for people that out there that have done forms to music, whether it's, you know, adjusting timing to fit music or, or making a form on its own, I mean, there's, it's a whole other level. You know, it's, it's, it's another piece. So a lot of people just kind of in the, in the broader martial arts realm have taught martial arts to people who, you know, martial arts isn't their thing. It's not their singular focus. It's something that kind of complements there are other stuff, you know, figure skating, dance. Uh, I know there have been a lot of news articles over the years about basketball players, pro basketball players who do martial arts. So it kind of sounds like martial arts was a, a supportive thing for you as you went through all this other stuff. Uh, More so than the focus. Is that? Is, I mean, I would say that. At f- I would say that at first. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually probably more through middle school, like elementary school it was. Um, I think I took a break in there from Taekwondo at one point. Mm -hmm. But as I got into high school, uh, I actually worked. Uh, So when I got a job, some things had to go. Mm -hmm. um, And actually Taekwondo stayed. So ice skating went and dance stayed. So um, definitely when I was younger, it was definitely just a complimentary thing uh it was with my dad so i just you know go with him right. whatever um but now as i got older actually it switched flip-flopped and i think that's probably about when we met yeah actually you know, it probably was and, and visiting your, your dad at classes 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, around like sophomore year of high school, I think. Yep. So eight, ten years ago, yeah. something like that. It's been a little while. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So, you know, through high school, you're training, training with your dad, and you mentioned moving, going on to school. So, you know, you go to college, and you mentioned a martial arts club. So, here we are. You're you're in a new place with new people, but martial arts has still had enough of a place in your mind, or if we want to be really cliche, in your heart. Right, that you wanted to keep doing it. So, tell me about that thought process, and tell me about the martial arts club. Yeah. So, uh, interesting. Um, so, I did my first semester of college abroad. Uh, Your very first semester. My very first semester. You, you didn't. Even, you just. I didn't even go to campus. I just <laughs> hopped a plane to Spain. I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> yeah, you can. Uh, they didn't have enough room for us on campus, so they, so they shipped you off to <laughs> Europe. <laughs> they shipped us off to Europe. All right. Um, and I got back and then, uh, I went through boot camp, So a whole other semester, not on campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, next semester I was still in training mm -hmm. and then I went back I didn't have any, the only people I knew were the people I went to Spain with. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I had gone back to class, um, when I was home from training and I was like, you know, I got back, went down to Connecticut where my school is, and I was like, well, uh, you know, I got to find something to do. I need to make some kind of friends. Mm. And uh, martial arts is always a good way to make friends. We yeah. always had our little, like, Taekwondo family. Right. Uh, and so someone found out somewhere that there was a martial arts club, and I went to, like, their interest meeting. And actually, uh, the friends I ha there, uh, two of them I'm still extremely good friends with today. Okay, cool. And they both graduated and moved on. So it's, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had different people. Um, the guys who ran it, most of them were like jujitsu guys. Mm -hmm. So some of it was uh, just learning the techniques for jujitsu. And once in a while, like uh, as the years went on, I taught a couple things uh, if they didn't know it uh, based, you know, there was a lot of ground fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, ours is more, you know, stand up, right. uh, typical sparring, yeah. but like self-defense, that was actually a big thing. Um, especially for some of the other women in the class, they wanted the self-defense. Yeah. So that was actually a main focus for the club. Okay. Um, it sounds like it was really diverse and, and oh, yeah. uh, almost like a sharing atmosphere versus a you know more of a traditional top-down martial arts hierarchy yeah we uh we actually talked about uniforms once but uh you know a bunch of college kids they the money wasn't there no for no someone. uniforms or street clothes no or yeah, athletic street clothes. clothes yeah okay. uh you know we do warm-ups and stuff like that yeah. and but for the most part it was just uh sharing people who some people had tons of experience some had none yeah um no. There was only like, I mean, there wasn't many of us at all. So it was pretty much just a group of people who liked martial arts and got together. So what was that like coming from a traditional, fairly regimented environment, you know, wearing a dobok uh, for, for non-Korean uh, practitioners, that's the equivalent to a gi. Um, I, don't, I don't use a ton of terms on the show. So I try to throw it out, out there when I do, uh, you know, so not wearing a uniform, you know, not having... A, a, you know, I'm guessing a ranking system if you didn't have uniforms, yeah, no. not even a, a fixed curriculum, not one person um, teaching everything. You know, that's pretty opposite to oh, what yeah. you grew up with. So what was that like? So it's definitely weird. Um, I definitely prefer having a uniform on okay. when I'm, uh, you know, practicing yeah. martial arts. Uh so, yeah, um, it's definitely weird because it's kind of chaotic in a sense because you're kind of like, all right, who do I look to? Like we had, you know, mm -hmm. a president or vice president because all the clubs had to have sure. on campus, had to have something. And so, you know, we had those guys for like administrative work, you know, making sure the club was still going. But 
it's very odd because sometimes you just show up and people will show up or they won't show up. And right. uh, you're like, oh, like, where is so-and-so? And they're like, oh, well, they had another obligation. Mm. You know, typical stuff uh, happens, but like not having, we don't line up, you don't bow in, you mm. don't bow out. Um, and of course we were just in a, like a racquetball court in yeah. the rec center. So sometimes you had like people like walking by and, uh, you know, we're sitting there just doing self-defense, but you also had to be careful because we couldn't hold the school liable for anything either. Right. Uh, so it's very chaotic. And the I acoustics and say, racquetball courts are wonderful. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. If There's I, no yelling or like oh. key ups or anything like that. So, yeah. uh, yeah, it's uh, very interesting. Of course, you got all the different personalities. Um, some were very, you know, alpha, like they're going to take charge. And some right. were like, oh, whatever. Like, I don't really care. So, um, and you don't have that structure to kind of, yeah, we don't have the structure to very, to, uh, to put that focus that, in there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so okay. it's very interesting compared to the, uh, like, you know, my dad's class or Master Rota's class, or I'm sure any other class that a martial arts is used to. Yeah. Uh, cause it's just kind of like, oh, it's, you know, six o'clock we'll start. Um, and then we're like, eh, all right, I guess we'll be done. You know, racket court has the racquetball courts goes somewhere else now. So, right. okay. uh, yeah, it's funny though. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about the you know, how those kind of two ends of the spectrum relate, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the military piece, you know, a little bit later on. So I think that gives us a pretty good idea as to, you know, you and your views on martial arts. I mean, we can read between the lines a lot about, you know, with, with what you just said, you know, and what you prefer and, and certainly your enjoyment of martial arts if you've continued to do it for all these years. But um, you, like every other martial artist on the planet, has a ton of stories, and I'd like you to tell us one of your best stories. Uh, so I've been thinking about this one. This question has been a uh, one that's been like going on in my mind. And, it happens for everybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay. Okay. So there's a, oh, there's a couple. Uh, but one of them, uh, actually, you can probably remember him. Uh, I think his name was Ryan. Uh, he, he was doing my dad's class quite a few years ago. Hmm. Um, he was testing for, uh, testing for one of his belts. Anyway, like I came to the sparring point and my dad threw me in there and he, for some odd reason, he went to do a scooping block mm -hmm. and, but I was about to kick. So where he was going with it, I don't really know. Um, it's, kind of came back to the uh, whole control thing on your kicks and I luckily had enough control because I bopped him in the nose but just slightly enough but he like stopped and he was like uh I shouldn't have done that I was like yeah you probably shouldn't probably not have the best <laughs> I was yeah. like, um but that was it was just kind of funny that one like it always stands out to me I don't know why I think it's just because it was the most ridiculous block I've probably seen in a sparring match. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually pretty proud of the fact that I had enough control on my kick to yeah. not break his nose. How old were you at that point? 15, 16 okay. maybe. All right. And um, not that we generally do physical descriptions on the show, but you are not a tall individual. <laughs> no. So, if you, so if, if you were kicking someone in the nose, then you were probably putting a little bit behind the kick yeah. to get, to get that foot up there. Right. I mean, yeah. if, if Ryan is who I remember him to be. He was a bit taller than you. Yes. Yes, he was. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, and actually height probably plays into more of the, uh, funnier stories that I have for martial arts. Okay. Just because, uh, I usually Part, you know, I usually practice martial arts, but usually very tall people yeah. like to uh, do it. And I usually don't have someone my height to work with. Uh, that was probably, that was like uh, last year before we were going for our black belt, we uh, had squad competitions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we had gone through all of our stuff and we're getting ready. 
you know, our final like week before our testing. And, uh, there was only two women. It was me and my friend Liz and the rest of them were guys. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the staff sergeant was like, well, I'm not gonna stick you two on the same team. Like you guys are gonna be split up. And so we get split up. And of course he put all the big dudes on my team and he puts all like the, the smaller guys on her team. And I'm like, what, this is going to suck. And, uh, the first thing we have to do is buddy relays and, uh, buddy relays. So we had eight, eight people. So we all had split into two people and we had either had to do a fireman carry or a buddy drag or pistol belt drag. Maybe it was only six people. I think it was six. And then, um, so, you know, the guys look at me and they're like, all right, uh, which, which one are, which one are you good at? Because yeah. you're gonna have to carry one of us. And so I was like, okay, I guess we'll do the pistol belt drag. Um, it's all leg work pretty much. Okay. And, uh, they're like, okay, well the lightest guy here is 190 pounds. <laughs> And uh, I am not 190 pounds. No, no you're not. I'm not, not going to ask you your weight. But there, there's a there's a gap in between 190 yes. and you. Know, we'll leave it at that. And uh, so we had to, you know, I think didn't no, we went last, but I uh, I booked it across that field with him, so it worked. But for him, it was an easier time. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, oh man. Like, you just had to stick the short person with all the really tall people, all the really big people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, it, you know, it worked, though, because uh, right. I'd always have the tall people. But I'd always made sure I worked with the the big people. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that's important. I think, you know, one of the things when I'm teaching self-defense that I try to get people to realize is that statistically you're going to be attacked by someone bigger. Yeah. Small people don't generally bully attack, assault, whatever, someone who is larger than them just doesn't usually work. No, it Unless really... they're, they're in a group. Yeah. a whole other... Oh, they have the Napoleon piece. complex. Yeah. That's pretty much all you see it with. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, so my dad always made sure I had... always fought the biggest person, mm -hmm. could take him down, mm -hmm. which works out in my favor. It sure does. So we've talked about, you know, a couple of the other hobbies and pursuits that you you did as a kid you know dance and soccer and ice skating other than martial arts and school and being in the military right which i mean that, that's probably plus sleep and eating is probably 98 percent of your life maybe even more is there anything else you enjoy doing um yeah uh i like to i like to read um just fiction mm -hmm. uh, especially when i'm done like school and I don't have to worry about cramming any more information into my head. Uh, yeah. Just reading a good book is always fun or watching movies. Uh, just hanging out with uh, my friends. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of now uh, moved on, you know, different states, different countries. Sure. Uh, I love to travel, though. Um, that works out well. It really does. I've actually probably traveled quite a bit this year. Um and I have friends all over the world, so it Great. really helps. Where's your favorite place you've been? My favorite place, France. France. Why? Uh, okay, so most people like Paris. Mm. Um, Paris was not my favorite, actually. Okay. Um, I love the countryside. It's beautiful mm. out there. Um, Normandy was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely a breathtaker because... You can still see the craters from all the bombs from like D-Day really? and everything. Oh, yeah. Cool. And all like the trenches and stuff. Pretty cool is the wrong, the wrong word, but interesting. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's definitely a sight to see because mm. you're still on the beaches and everything. Uh, and the cemetery, mm. it's just, you think Arlington is huge. Uh, Normandy is really? quite the cemetery. Yeah. Um, but like the Loire Valley has like all the chateaus and different... Um, like little towns and everything, and it's it's just beautiful. Nice. Uh, definitely a place just to go and see. You don't even have to definitely have a car. Uh, it's not like Paris where you can just like walk around, right. but uh, it's just everyone's friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Paris, they might say that they're not friendly to Americans, but uh, it's pretty different when you go to the countryside. Oh, cool. Okay. 
So I'd like you to think about a time in your life that things weren't going well, you know, and you can interpret that however you want and tell us how your time as a martial artist helped you get through that. Also, I've been thinking about this one quite a bit too. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll go with uh, this past semester, actually. Uh, it was a little bit, a little bit rougher. Um, I'm in my, you know, senior year. Uh, I just got back from a deployment. Um, and I got back to my job, which was with the school. Mm -hmm. And it was technically a company that's like under the school, but they kind of like follow their own rules. They're kind of like, it's a, it's kind of like a research job. And I had worked for this company for about two years before, uh, I'd left on my deployment and I had worked my way up to a pretty high level in the company and I get back from my deployment and they're like, Oh, well, we're going to put you back at the entry level position. Mm. And I'm like, well, like what? <laughs> I'm like, I just like, cause this whole job is all college students just trying to get experience and well, everything. Can, tell us a little bit about the job. So the job is like essentially research. Um, we're hired by some client and they want research on, uh, typically like, uh, I can't say too much about the job. Okay. Uh, it's basically research on like violent extremism. Like that's what okay. I used to do. Okay. Uh, violent extremism around the world. And we would put it into like different databases and people would use our info for whatever they wanted. Okay. Um, statistical. Stuff. Yeah. Trend analysis Incidents and stuff like that. And, yeah. Okay. And, uh, that's what I study is, you know, terrorism and violent, uh, or violent extremism, extremism or mm -hmm. armed conflict. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was at the job and I was doing this semester. I also had an internship with uh, the Connecticut State Police. Mm -hmm. And then I had a full class load. And, uh, you know, it's typically it's what it is. But this job, I, everyone hates working there. Mm. Why? Uh, management sucks. Okay. <laughs> like, uh, I even told them that when I left. I was like, uh, you really have to fix this. And uh, just people hate it. But... You know, college students, they need the money. I had other incomes coming in, so I actually quit a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, but that actually, I think, came from... I was trying to figure out, like, before I quit, um, I'd gone on vacation and for a week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is so nice. Like, I am not at work right now. This is amazing. And the idea that, you know, for... Like two months, I was just like, I hate this job. Like, I hate having to go here. I hate having to, uh, like everything. Like, I'm just like, I really don't want to go to class and go to this job. And I was like, why? Like, why am I doing this to myself? If, you know, you're not happy, why am I here? And then I looked back on, because I was like, well, you know, uh, I'm pretty excited to deploy again. And I'm like, what made last year like so different? And I had probably more self-confidence uh, last year. And I was very, um, my friend called me a spitfire last year. I was very, uh, ag not aggressive, but very forward mm -hmm. with my thoughts on things. And, uh, you know, I was a supervisor for different things and, uh, I was in different places for different reasons, but I also realized that I was in Micmap and it really helped me just like bring that self-confidence back. And I was just so, uh, I just loved going and I even realized like even in Taekwondo, you know, you get that self-confidence and you realize that, you know, you don't have to put up with a job that is doesn't care about you mm. and uh that yeah I thought back to it and I'm like you know what I want that person back from last year mm. and so decided to quit because I was like 
you know, I mean, I had, you know, a couple other incomes coming in, so right. I could you didn't afford need it. it. Uh, but, I, you know, I think the important thing is, is that you're happy. You know, money isn't everything in this world, but... Um, yeah, martial arts just like helps you bring back that self confidence that I think people really need about themselves. It sounds like you were able to, to kind of lean back on a foundation that martial arts had given you for who you were as a person, and you recognized that this job was kind of stealing your your essence, your soul, however you want to look at <laughs> yeah. it, right? It, it, yeah, I mean, the face you just made when I said that, you know, I think that sounds like that resonates pretty strongly that you were investing some a good portion of yourself into something that wasn't giving back. You know, I mean, it was putting some money in your pocket, but it sounds like that was it. And you were investing far more than than what that money was worth to you, which is which is why you quit. And I think that that's something that for a lot of us that have been training, that foundation becomes really important, whether it's you know, the, the foundation of your martial arts family or the foundation of going through your black belt test or whatever it is that there's that, that piece there that no one can ever take away from you. And, and once you are able to look through that lens, a lot of other stuff just doesn't, it doesn't add up, you know, what, what you put out versus what comes back, you know, it, it should balance. I mean, ideally it should, you know, you're, you're hoping that more comes back than you put out, right? I mean, that's just, that's our, that's our hope in life but you know when you, you can only be drained for so long yeah uh i was at the point where i was just like i'm done yeah. and uh there definitely has to be a balance between work and social life mm -hmm. and uh your life cannot just be work because otherwise you just miss out on everything yeah i mean just going to even just like you know taekwondo class like you it's not even just like the workout that you like or what you're doing. It's the people around you that really make it fun. Yeah. Um, and that's actually like anywhere. Uh, you know, I, the people I worked with were great, but mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if everyone is so unhappy in a place, you're just kind of like, oh, I mean, yeah. at this point, <laughs> what's the point? Right. And uh, I mean, but then you go to... Like, if you find a job that you like and you love the people, you, you know, you try to hold on to it because, well, it just makes your life that much better. Right. <laughs> right. So you've mentioned MCMAP. I'm, I'm guessing the MC stands for Military Combatives? Uh, Marine Corps Martial Arts Program. Oh, okay. I was, I was wrong. The MA, I would have guessed, is Martial Arts. So this might be a good chance to talk about that and how you've gone through that program. And that was part of why I wanted to have you on the show so you could talk about the, the way that program compares to a traditional martial arts program and the things you learned, the things that were the same. You know, So just kind of give us an overview about that. So uh, when I first got to Djibouti, which is in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, the Horn of Africa, and my sponsor was like, oh, um, like he's like, you like, martial arts and I'm like yeah yeah and he's like well we have a couple groups on base and he's like they actually just started a class for the Marine Corps martial arts program you know kind of describing it and I was like okay yeah cool why not and so I uh I meet up I uh, meet one of the marines and he's like show up at the field you know at like this time and I show up and I brought my roommate along at the time and she because she had gone overseas with me mm -hmm. and uh she was like you know, the colonel running it at the time was like, are you sure you want to do this? And we're like, yeah, like, <laughs> why, why not? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, he's like, are you sure? Like, yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't really know what else to say. And uh, he's like, okay, okay. And the one thing that probably stuck out the most, and uh, I don't know, I've not, like, our program was run differently than the MCMAP programs back in the States, um, you know, different re resources are different and everything like that. But the one thing is, uh, he's like, you have to be okay with violence. He's like, you know, the people here aren't gonna, like people in the field aren't gonna want to, uh, you know, just 
be nice to you. Uh, they're, they're there to kill you and you have to be okay with the violence that comes along with it. And you know, that, that sticks out because that's typically not something that I heard. Like, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to be okay with, you know, taking somebody down, but the violence that goes behind it, um, you know, the different graphics you'll see is something that is not usually, uh, mentioned in classes, Yeah. especially when you're trying to promote it. Like most people don't want to deal with it. Right. Um, so that was very interesting to hear. And I was like, okay, like, you know, you know, you understand and you, the way you train is the way you're going to fight in the real world. So you, I mean, obviously we're not going to kill each other on this turf field, but (laughs) you have to be able to go at it at a good pace. And so I was going with, uh, my first belt and which is the tan belt. And to my knowledge, tan belt, tan belt. Um, and these are belts we wear like with our uniform. Uh, we train in, we call it Utes and Boots, which is, uh, like our utility uniform with our, uh, like combat boots. So mm-hmm. it's the pants, uh, like a t-shirt, the t-shirt that we wear under our blouse and then our combat boots for the first belt. And it's just the basic, you know, like punching, different kicks, different, you know, hooks. It's the basics that most people learn in your first week or so of martial arts that you're into it like your first belt for taekwondo um and then once you go on to your gray but like once you graduate from tan and you go on to gray belt uh you start to wear like a vest um it's not as heavy as like a plated vest but it's still uh um i don't want to say the bulletproof i guess they could be uh but you wore those for all your trainings um so, you know, you would do warm-ups, uh, you know, you'd go running, uh, you would do different strength activities. And as you're going through it, some of it's very similar to martial arts where, you know, it's kicks, punches, uh, you learn different self-defense techniques. But the thing about MCMAP is it's usually a mixture of a couple different martial arts and like one. And it's very interesting because I went through a couple instructors. So, like, our colonel left about gray belt time. Okay. So, it was a staff sergeant, and he was my instructor the remaining of the time. Uh, We just ended up getting a couple more instructors in near the end. Mm -hmm. And their uh, approach on different things. Uh, So, you know, sometimes they think, well, you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. Uh, I had one guy who was like, no, you can tweak it to like your size. So certain like hip throws or whatever, Mm. or, um, he would show me different ways based on my height. Like if I had someone a lot taller than me, I've had to handle it. Uh, so it's interesting to see the different, uh, perspectives that people have, especially because some people had other martial arts backgrounds. Um, you know, I don't, some people like do Krav Maga, some people do Jitsu, some people... It's a whole plethora of different knowledge. Kind of like the club. Yeah. On campus. Uh, there's definitely a lot more structured, though. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, it was actually interesting because we had two Japanese guys that did it with it. We had Japanese mm-hmm. on base. And uh, we were doing... I forgot what belt it was. We were doing, like, a ring. And we were doing, like, a stand-up sparring type thing. Mm-hmm. And um, I got done and the Japanese guys came up to me afterwards and they're like, Oh, do you have like, do you have background in another like martial art? And I was like, yeah, take one down. He's like, Oh, you have a very like similar stance to like that kind of style. That's why we figured cause they have background in, I don't know what they have it in, but another martial Something. art, but it was just interesting to see how they could pick up that I had previous experience in another art, yeah. other than micmap and um so yeah we had because we had a there's a ugandan in the class after me mm-hmm. uh it's just it was very intro it was a joint environment so you know everyone from everywhere that's probably how it's different from here in the states um the workouts are uh well they're a little rough sometimes especially when you have a lot of ammo cans <laughs> uh ammo cans like 30 pounds okay and uh so even though you know, just 
being over there, there's, there's a physical component that, you know, there's a minimum and that's something that we really don't get in most martial arts classes here. You know, the, the conditioning tends to be part of the class rather than just, you have to come in with this expectation. You still had conditioning as part of your martial arts classes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that we... surprises me. I, I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah, no, we, uh, we'd start out, we'd line up on the line and we'd do mm -hmm. basic stretches, like kind of going back and forth and then eventually it'd get harder and planks were our big thing. Uh, by our black belt, we had to hold like three minute planks. Wow. Um, so we'd work up to it, you know, regular planks, side planks. Um, yeah, the exercise component, uh, is a big thing for that area so um, why do you think that is what is it because it's it, a it's a combative it's okay. uh the difference i guess with micmap versus all these others is when you learn to take somebody down you also learn how to hold them there hmm. um there are some where you had to put like flexi cuffs on people um when you have them down you tell them to you know turn their head cross their legs make sure you cross their feet um it's almost like you're giving a directive mm -hmm. to them um because you're not taking down like somebody in a class you're it's meant to take um an enemy down okay. uh and of course we don't uh you know we have pow's we don't just kill like right. a lot of our terrorists do now um different rules that we have yeah. but it's, uh, I think it's important because when you have that conditioning, you have that, uh, workout you're in when typically when you're in the field, you're in, uh, you know, full vest helmet, mm -hmm. uh, combat boots are not typically light. Um, so it's important to have that, uh, I don't want to say to have that fitness level to be able to like hold your own. Mm. I, I would wonder too that the ability to to perform these movements while you're tired is probably an important piece. That's actually a huge thing. Uh, they actually, as we got into the ranks, we would do a lot of um, like exercises to tire us out, mm. and then we would get thrown in the ring, and we'd have to okay. fight. Um, and I think anybody that's listening that's trained for more than a little while knows how quickly form can go to crap. Yeah. And actually one thing that we're told too, is like a lot of it's not about form. It's how well you can just, as long as you can get them down, like get them down. Like if it looks crappy, don't worry about it. You know, like it doesn't need to look like a martial art movie where they're just, uh, uh, like swiftly going onto the ground you know, they look so pretty getting thrown onto the ground. No, it's going to look like a disaster. Yeah, I, I think, you know, not that we talk a lot about MMA on this show, but if you want to see a good example of that, I, I caught some of the fights over the weekend. And, and yeah, you, you watch a fight that goes into round three, even if it's been, you know, nine, 10, 12 minutes. I mean, not that that's a short amount of time, certainly, but you would think 10 minutes, you know, a professional fighter can handle 10 Don't. minutes of punishment and, you know, they're, they look like a, they look like a zombie. Even like, uh, you know, we would do like three minute rounds, yeah. uh, just like ground fighting. And it's either until somebody taps out or until three minutes are up. But if you can hold yourself for like those three minutes, three minutes is a long time in the yeah. ring. So, uh, yeah, that, um, conditioning really helps that for a while. And even just practicing, you know, just, uh, we'd have this one exercise and you'd have to, um, like you would have an ammo can and you'd have to like run it a certain distance and then back. And then they would like throw you in the ring. And mm. then, you know, it was kind of like a relay and you had to keep going or, um, what was some of the, I forget some of the others, but, or, you know, they would just do a lot of exercise to tie you out. Um, yeah. and it was, yeah, it was, uh, sometimes it's really rough and you're just, you're dead at the end you're sweating. And of course it's in Africa. And <laughs> so it's like a hundred degrees and it's humid outside and you're like, this is terrible, but it's so much fun. <laughs> and those of us that have trained inside and, in, you know, 80 degrees without air conditioning, you know, we'll, uh, 
will often complain. I've certainly been guilty of that. Yes, myself. Master of his, uh Yeah, he um, loves having the window shut, doesn't <laughs> yes, he? Yes, he does. Doesn't he? So I want to go back to something that, that you said that kind of struck me, and I'm curious of, of your how this might have affected your, your view on martial arts overall. The way you train is the way you fight, or the way you engage. I forget the exact word you used. But that makes a lot of sense, and that's something that we hear coming from, let's say, uh, I know we've had some guests on the show who have really hated this term, but reality-based martial arts versus what we tend to think of with traditional martial arts. You know, that, that tends to be a, a big sticking point. And we've talked a lot on the show about the difference in the focus. You know, traditional martial arts isn't just about fighting and self-defense, that there's a lot more to it. But has that concept, that intensifying of training, has that changed the way you look at Taekwondo or life? Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, so, you know, now when I, I don't go to my dad's class, I'm in Connecticut most of the time, but right. uh, I went once and I showed him a couple ground techniques, but like yeah. we have other people that come in and show that too. And um, I think it's really important to realize that um, like, yeah, you don't want to hurt the people that you're training with, but I mean, you know, I study terrorism and armed conflict. So you, I see a lot of the, uh, violence that people mm. have in themselves and I think everyone's capable of it. It's just knowing when to unleash the violence. Um, and I think that training the way that you should fight is important because i mean if like if someone comes at you and you're just used to you know uh softly putting somebody on the ground like oh i'm just gonna do a soft leg kick they're they're not gonna go down like that's not how it's gonna go it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit harder for them to really put them down um which is also why I think it's important to, when you do it, you tell the person like, okay, no, it's like the person you're training with, they, you know, like, well, move my wrist more this way and you're really going to get it. Um, and you practice over and over again. So you know that if you ever get attacked, it's going to be like, all right, like I know how this is going to go. And I guess it can go into uh, everyday life. Like, you know, if you're training uh for your new job and you just kind of like half half that you're like oh whatever but you know when it actually gets to the uh when it gets to the point where you you're on your own you have to do it um and then all of a sudden it comes to the point and you're like oh i don't know how to do this because i didn't pay attention in my training right and especially like in a life or death situation, uh, you know, like, you know, if you're a cop or if you're a uh, well, military member in the field, uh, you, you don't want, you don't want to take that seriously because it could mean a life or death, not just for you, but the person next to you. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I think this is always going to be something that's debated among martial artists because there's, and I don't know that there's a right answer, you know, and I, I, oh. I, don't, I don't know. If you if you would agree, I mean, because, you know, different people need different things. They need material presented in different ways. There are people that I think when they come into any kind of martial arts program, whatever it is, if that intensity is there right away, it's going to be scary for them. There are others that are going to that's really going to click for them. You know, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to depend on the situation because some people like they uh you know, they join martial arts and they're like, yeah, I just want to get my aggression out, you know, whatever. Maybe they join a certain style for that. Yeah. But if you go into a structured environment, a lot of it, um, it puts a lot of discipline on you. Um, teaches, it's kind of like the military. You go in and you learn discipline, you learn respect. Um, and I think that's important for people to learn because, you know, just because you can beat the shit out of somebody doesn't mean you should, right. you know, like... You don't want to, you know, I think that's also the part of it where when you go towards your black belt, that maturity comes with it. 
and you realize that, okay, I am trained to take somebody down and hurt them, but, you know, I don't, I don't need to. There are other ways to resolve an issue besides that, unless they're actually going to attack you, and then, well, yeah. then you can actually use it, but... I want to bring up one more piece on the the military combatives before we move forward because I'm, you know, I'm just kind of I'm I'm trying to put myself in in your place. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I I know the the martial arts upbringing that you had. I know a lot of the people that were involved. So I'm just imagining you deploying. You're in Africa, and you're in this program. What were your thoughts on that intensity? Did it seem out of place? Did it seem abrupt? I mean, did you have a strong reaction to it? Because I, I think I would. Yeah, because uh, at first you're like, you know, I really don't want to hurt this yeah. person. You're like, uh, you know, and most of the time you won't, you won't hurt them. Uh, you know, you're falling with a vest. It, it, you know, has some impact or, you know, hits some impact with you. But yeah, um, it's definitely something you have to, you slowly, uh, I saw in me, um, going through the ranks, you know, so at first you're kind of like, eh, like, you know, hitting the bags, hitting, you know, that's fine. Cause you know, we're used to that, but right. when it comes to like people, uh, and throwing them or, uh, you know, as you get up there, you you start to get thrown from more higher places, you know, like a shoulder throw. So you're being thrown from somebody's shoulder height, not just their hip height. And you're, but in order to get that momentum, you have to really show that, uh, violence, I guess, yeah. because otherwise you just don't have the strength to like really throw them. And I think, uh, even the people I worked with, they could see a different change, at least in me and the other woman that was there yeah. uh, throwing. And even with the guys with us, because um, a lot of the guys were afraid to work with us, the woman, because yeah. they had the mentality, you know, you can't hit a woman. Right. But we're like, you know, look, if you don't train with us the right way, you know, we're really not going to learn anything. Yeah. So they definitely saw the uh, intensity level go up. And I think that's important. You know, as long as you're improving with that skill, uh, it's never going to be 100. You know, the psychological uh, psychological thing that comes with the violence is something that I think people have in their own time. Uh, and I've never experienced it, but I know people have. Yeah. And I think uh, it's just the training is really helpful. But, you know, the aftermath is something everyone works out differently. It, you know, we'll, we'll move on from this because I, I don't want the whole conversation to be about this. And, and actually, we've, we've spent a great chunk of time. And I, and I feel like I understand <laughs> yeah. what that program looked like. And, and I hope the listeners do do as well. We've gotten some bits and pieces. We had uh, Mr. Tony Blower on and uh, we had a Krav Maga practitioner out of uh, the Boston area, uh, Mr. Gershon Ben Karen. I'll link to both of those episodes in the show notes. So uh, anybody that's new to the show that doesn't know that we do this, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com will have a, a, a show notes page with links to everything we're talking about and, and your dad's episode and, and uh, you know, the other stuff that we've talked about today. Um, actually, one last thing before we move on, because it, it, it's in my head kind of unfinished. How did the belts go? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a tan belt, which... Uh, to my knowledge, uh, every Marine comes out with a tan belt. It's just the basics. Okay. Uh, and then it goes gray belt mm -hmm. and then green belt and brown belt and black belt. Okay. Um, yeah, I trained four days a week, about two hours a day. Wow. And about five months. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, That's... yeah, it was, especially with the, my schedule constantly rotated and I locked out on a lot of it, but, uh, yeah, sometimes, especially if your job requires you to stay longer hours, um, usually class is like an hour, but a lot of us would actually go an hour before with the previous class and just um, like sustain and mm -hmm. make sure we're ready to for the next testing coming up. Just doing rough math in my head, that's, you know, that's about 18 months for what most people would train. Yeah. You know, 
two days a week, hour, hour and a half, you know, so that, that's, that's a lot of time. That's pretty intensive. And w you earned your black belt. I did. In that program. Yep. So. Yep. That was, uh, yeah, I earned it almost a year ago. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. And is there more, is there degrees? I mean, do you keep training or is it kind of a capped program like that? So I guess for me, I think it's kind of capped because I'm Navy, uh, but the Marines can go on and do their instructor course. Okay. And uh, apparently that's three weeks of hell. Uh, the guys that I've talked to anyway, and I've seen some videos of like what they do, and it's just pretty much three weeks of getting the ish beat out of you. <laughs> and then uh, you can eventually go on and, you know, uh, earn like your red tabs and stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure you have to go through the instructor school first. But that props to them who go through that because... Uh, that's intense stuff. Sure. So. All right. Well, let's let's take it out of the military stuff. Let's kind of you know talk more about your martial arts upbringing overall. Um, like I said, and if if people haven't completely figured out, you know, we we talk about some of the guests on the, on the show as being part of my martial arts family. Oh yeah. Um, you know, you've mentioned Master Rota a couple times, who is my primary instructor still. And, uh, I keep harassing him to come on the show. He will relent at some point. Uh, he hasn't said <laughs> no, but, uh, he's a pretty humble guy. So yeah, he uh, is. That's, that's why that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. So I know some of these people that have been part of your upbringing. I'm going to take him out from possible answers. I'm going to take your dad out. Who has been the most influential on your martial arts upbringing? Uh, jeez. I'm going to take those out, of course, because those are the obvious answers. And we don't tend to get good stories. Yeah. Out of those. Um, that's difficult because I've had so many people come in and out of my martial arts, like, world. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been gone or, you know, they went in and they came out. Uh, I guess a lot of different people have had influences um if pinning it to one is geez. is too hard you know tell us about a couple of them and, and why they were influential uh well i'll go with uh last year because last year was also just a whole other experience in itself um but my friend liz was a huge help um she was the other woman that did the class with me there were five women that started and only two of us made mm. it and uh, I think having that other help, like really, the other counterpart really helps because uh, we had a little bit of uh, pull from the guys because they, you know, some of them were afraid to, uh, you know, work with us. They didn't want to hurt us or some, you know, still have the mentality of, uh, you know, women shouldn't be doing it. So it's helpful having another woman to go through it with. Um so she, you know, big, big help, big influence because we kind of pushed each other. Mm. Um, growing up, uh, I mean, you know, there was like Nish and Tony Grout. They, you know, did class for a long time and mm. Nish still does it. They, I mean, having Tony there, she was helpful because she'd show me like, her perspectives or like you and Brendan even, uh, yeah. I mean, working with you guys was always fun. Uh, you always showed me different techniques or different ways to do things. I remember one testing, you just kept like throwing, it was like the end of my red belt testing, I think. And you just kept throwing kicks at me and I eventually just grabbed your leg and I was like, I'm just going to hold you here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, even even some of the kids, like my dad's class, like, uh, I don't remember Eliza. Yeah. Uh, she was an inspirational kid because she had, like, a heart problem, and yeah. she still came to class and just went at it. She was fun to work with. Everybody's got something to teach. Yeah, they really do. Like, it doesn't matter what your age is or what your physique is, like, you know, yeah. fitness level or anything. Pew. One of the things I remember my, my original instructor saying, uh, if you want, 
if you want to see how differently things can be done, teach something to a white belt and watch what they do with it because it'll, you'll look at it and go, I didn't even know your body could move in that way. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, uh, yeah, that's the yeah, truth. That's uh, I mean, I don't know. I just, I mean, everyone had some kind of influence because I always look at different things. I like to look at things from different perspectives and uh, really see how other people react to um, how other people do things. And that's just an interest, personal interest uh, on perspective. So, yeah. And you're kind of living that. I mean, you you know, you started with Taekwondo and, and then you go to this martial arts club where different people are contributing different things. And then you, you, you enter the, the Marine Corps program and you're, you know, learning different things there, you know, so it's all, it's, it's all martial arts, but it's different perspectives. Yeah. You know, so that, that really makes sense. Yeah, no, uh, I think, I think it's important because, um, martial arts isn't just about your form or anything like that. It's about your mentality towards it. And, uh, if you don't come into it with like an open mind, I think sometimes it's really difficult to work with other people because you're like, and you know, you're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to do it this way. Mm. But sometimes you didn't see that this other way has another advantage for somebody else that other people don't have. So I think it's important to really have that, uh, open mind going into it. So... Do you have any martial arts goals for the future? Are, are you still training? You know, what's what's going on with, you know, you as you move forward here? Uh, actually, I want to, uh, I'm going to start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the spring. Not the spring, like uh, winter, next semester. Uh, one of my friends, she recently got into it. And um, I definitely want a different uh, background again mm -hmm. before, uh, I deploy again in June, uh, to get back into a different mentality. So, sure. uh, I think going back into martial arts is, or at least a different form of it is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited to go to learn jujitsu. I know a lot of people have done it. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Um, honestly, just to Keep going. Uh, I don't really care which one I learn. I'll learn. I think Krav Maga is pretty cool. I know uh, some people. I know one guy who does Kali, mm. which is awesome. Mm. Uh, he could probably kill me <laughs> five times with a knife in like two seconds. So, I mean, it's insane. The knife, different knife combatives are neat. I'm starting to uh, learn some of that myself. Yeah, I he he was showing me some things and. Uh, it's a very finesse way to do things. It's very smooth and just like he was showing me something and he moved his hand like three times and I was like, well, I just died yeah. in like a brutal way. <laughs> so uh, that was actually a lot of fun to kind of learn just for like a day or two. Cool. But anything, I'll learn anything. I think that's a great attitude. Someone I try to have. Yeah. Everybody's got something to teach. Yeah, I think so. I think it's uh, important to learn, too, just different styles. How about some parting advice for everybody listening? What would you share? I would say, you know, keep going with it. Um, use what you learn in your personal life. Uh, always keep the friends that you make too along the way because uh it's important to have um i still keep in touch with some of the guys i've done micmap with mm -hmm. um and even taekwondo with and i think uh it's important to just keep in you know, just keep an open mind about anything you go into because everyone's going to have a different perspective on something. And it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it's different than yours. So I think it's important to learn and, you know, just really listen to people when they, when they try to teach you something new. Because maybe you'll be better at it in the end because it's something you hadn't thought of. It was nice to have a chance to catch up with Miss Lenahan. It's been a couple of years since we've been able to sit down and really chat. 
She's a dedicated person, not just in her martial arts training, but in life. She's exactly the type of person I want protecting this country. Thank you, Miss Lenahan, for your time on the show. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with links to information on the Marine Corps martial arts program and some fun photos. I was only able to find one of the two of us, but it goes back a few years, and I think some of you listening will get a kick out of it. You should also check out her father's episode, Master Joe Lenahan, from episode 12, to give you more context on Miss Lenahan's background. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram with the username Whistlekick. You should also check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to come on or maybe suggest someone else, your instructor perhaps, go ahead, hit the website, and fill out the form over there. If you have feedback, we'd love to hear it. You can do that on the website, or shoot me an email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you like the show, be sure you're subscribing, and if you're up for giving something back, We'd like to suggest sharing the show with some friends to help it grow, or you can leave us a review, join the newsletter list, get in on that Facebook group, like Whistlekick on Facebook, or make a purchase. Those are all wonderful ways that you can help the company out, help us grow, so we can continue to do wonderful things and support the martial arts community. It's a new year. Maybe it's time for a new pair of sparring gloves. You know, they're in four colors now, and they're available at Whistlekick.com. If you're a school owner or team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.